Hi everyone. In recent videos, we've been looking at the importance of connection with our children. A connection on its own is not enough. We also need to have good boundaries with them. Let's think of it like this light. If I want this light to shine, it needs to be plugged in. And that's like the connection we have with our children. If we want our children to do well in life, whether they're our own children or the children in our classrooms, if we want our children to shine, we need to have a good connection with them. I can switch this switch all I want, but if the light's not plugged in, it won't shine. In the same way with children, we can give our lesson, try to teach them things, give a lecture, nag them about things. But if we don't have a good connection with them, we'll never get to the best results. My first teaching post involved both teaching and counseling. Now I knew as a new teacher that connection with the children was important, but as I was soon to discover, it's totally not enough. Being kind and approachable was working in the counseling side of my job. It was just one small problem. I also had to teach the whole school, the whole school, class after class after class, once a week. And then the next week, I start again and see class after class after class. And those classes were between 45 and 48 students, teenagers, because it was a high school. My kind, compassionate approach was working well in the counseling room, in the classroom, not so much. Here were these large classes of teenagers basically eating me for breakfast. So let's go back to our light analogy. Let's say that the light is plugged in, so there's a good connection, but we need more than a good connection. The light has wires which connect it to that plug. What if those wires had no insulation? What if there was just a bare copper wire? What would happen if I touched that bare copper wire? I'd get a shock. I'd like to compare this to the situation with children. You need a good connection, but that's not all that you need. If you don't have good boundary, like this insulation here, the children's behavior gets shocking. And that's exactly what I was experiencing. Challenging behavior in every class. I was exhausted. I was overwhelmed. And I remember going on a desperate search for discipline skills. You see, in our course, we'd been prepared for how to teach our subject, but almost not at all for the discipline. So I went around and I spoke to experienced teachers. How do you get children to pay attention? How do you get them to listen and act respectfully in your class? The first teacher I asked said, well, you scream and you shout and you act like a dragon and after a while they listen. And I said, well, I can't do that. I'm the school counselor. If I scream and shout and act like a dragon, then they won't feel safe to come and speak to me. I asked another teacher and he said, don't smile until Easter. That ship had already sailed. I smiled on the first day. Another teacher told me a story about getting respect by caning a boy in front of the class. The theme you can see here is that teachers kept suggesting doing something punitive or nasty to get the required attention, and I needed to make children feel safe. Now, I think this was particularly marked because I was a school counsellor, but actually all of us as adults, if we understand how children work, how they need to feel safe to focus and concentrate and listen properly, then actually all of us have this problem. We need to have boundaries so that they will cooperate, but not in a way that makes them unsafe. So I had started teaching, feeling idealistic and positive, and within a few weeks, I was overwhelmed and frustrated and really didn't know what to do about all of this negative behavior. One day, while visiting an NGO targeting child abuse prevention, I found a pamphlet which said, 10 things to do instead of hitting. And I got excited about this. I pictured that this pamphlet would give me a list of non-violent discipline options. And I pictured that when children misbehaved in my class, I could just choose one that fitted with the situation. Eagerly, I picked it up and had a look at it. Here's what that pamphlet said. 10 things to do instead of hitting. Number one, take a deep breath. <sighs> okay. Number two, count to 10. Number three, Leave the room. Number four, go shopping. Now, I don't remember what else was on the pamphlet, but I can tell you that it was equally unhelpful to me as a teacher at the time. As frustrating as this experience was, I think this might have been the moment where, for me, 
the idea of a list of nonviolent discipline options was born. After that, I kept thinking, wouldn't it be cool if there was such a thing? Wouldn't it be cool if people could just find information on nonviolent discipline skills? Because actually, it's not usually that easy to do. So what Peace Discipline offers now is what I needed, what many needed 25 years ago and didn't get. Just options that you can choose from according to whether they fit in your situation or not. Obviously, in one video, I cannot go through all of those options. So in the meantime, you can access those skills by visiting our website at www.peacediscipline.com. Have a look at the Nonviolent Discipline Toolkit on the website. You can also have a look at the research that underpins a lot of these skills. Now, if we go back to me and my desperate search for positive skills, I'm happy to say that over the years, I found many nonviolent methods which worked in the classroom and it made such a difference where in my first few weeks of teaching I had gone home thinking I hate them all they're terrible compare that to a few years time where I was having a fantastic time with the children my classes were listening they were cooperating the children were respectful I thought they were awesome and the difference was not getting a different set of children the difference was me. I had learned appropriate boundary with those children. I had learned to nip things in the bud before they got out of control. I had learned not to let things escalate in my class. I had learned some containing skills so that disruptive behavior didn't hijack my class. Now, if you think about it, this is a really important part of making children feel safe in the classroom. It's not just about the positive regard and good relationship that you have with those children. It's not just about not frightening them or threatening them. It's also about having appropriate responses to their misbehavior. Because if you do not rein that in, then other children's education is disrupted and bullying thrives. How can they feel safe in an environment like that? We've been talking about attunement and how when your responses fit with children's signals, then they feel safer with you. But it turns out that a very important part of attunement is responding to children's misbehavior, knowing how to respond to defiance and disruption and challenging behavior. When your responses are appropriate in those situations, that's an important part of helping children to feel safe. Children watch us all the time and decide whether it's safe to approach us about the things that are bothering them. I remember a mother saying to me in my coaching practice that she was concerned her son was being bullied at school. One of the first things I asked her was, what does the teacher say about the situation? The mom said, you know, he hasn't told the teacher. And I asked, why not? And she said, I asked him that too. I said, why don't you tell the teacher? This young boy's answer was that these same children that were bullying him were also really rude to the teacher and she didn't really do anything about it. She never stopped them. Now, if you think about it, that's really quite logical on the part of that young boy. He's looking at the situation thinking, if she can't stop them being rude to her, how will she stop them when they're bullying me? So although the teacher might have been thinking that that was just an incident of rudeness towards her and perhaps thinking it was a right to ignore it, it was a signal to this young boy that she wouldn't be able to contain that behavior, that she wouldn't have an effective response if he spoke to her about what those children were doing to him. So we can see how appropriate responses to misbehavior are a big part of helping children feel safe. We need connection with them, but we also need boundary. So I found nonviolent discipline skills that worked and it made all the difference to my teaching career. And I'm happy to report that screaming, shouting, acting like a dragon, refusing to smile or hurting children in any way are not active ingredients of good discipline. I didn't need to use any of those things to get the respect and cooperation that was needed in the classroom. So we need connection, but we also need appropriate boundary. You need to be able to confront inappropriate behavior. And on this channel, that's what we'll be looking at. Lots of practical ways to have appropriate boundary with children. Attunement is what helps children feel safe. We need our responses to fit well with their signals. One of their signals may be misbehavior, and we need to know how to respond to that too. That's all for now. In our next video, we'll be looking at 
the importance of a sense of containment. Looking forward to sharing that with you. If you would like to know more about nonviolent discipline skills, visit the Peace Discipline website at www.peacediscipline.com and subscribe to this channel. Thanks for watching.